Hello there, and welcome to our first show of 2012. Today, we'll be looking at one of the most exciting aspects of modern astronomy. We'll be talking extrasolar planets. And then, we've got an interview with a young astronomer and talk about his interest in the oldest science. And finally, we'll take a look at the January night sky. Just one or two objects that you might like to find up there in these beautiful winter nights. But first, extrasolar planets, or exoplanets. These are planets that orbit distant stars in a similar way to the Earth and the other planets orbit the Sun. The first exoplanet going around a normal star was discovered in 1995 by two French astronomers. They discovered a planet orbiting a star near the square of Pegasus. 51 Pegasi was the first star to have a planet discovered around it. Since then, over 700 extrasolar planets have been found. We're finding them almost every day now. But this is the telescope that hit the news. A telescope in the Kepler spacecraft, which is out there in space, looking at a fairly small section of the sky and monitoring stars. And this is how it finds the planets. It looks at stars and watches their light dim. If a starlight dims, then it may be because a planet is passing in front of it. A transit of a planet makes the light curve drop. If this happens regularly, and it can be confirmed by other observatories, we know we've found planets. And in fact, now, our light curves are so complicated, we can detect multiple planet systems, rather like we have many planets in our own solar system. The important thing about this is that we can't actually see the planets. We can only detect them because of their effects on the star. Another method is not this transit method, but to see a star wobble slightly with the gravitational effect of the planet going round it. So although we can't see these planets, we definitely know they're there. The first planets found were big planets. They were the ones most easy to detect. These were big planets very close to their parent star, and they've been called hot Jupiters. But now, techniques are improving, and we can find even smaller planets. This wonderful image shows some of the stars that Kepler's looked at and found planets in orbit around them. Now, some of these need confirming, but it's discovered over a thousand planets orbiting other stars, over 50 of them may be like the Earth. Late last year, great news. Kepler discovered two planets about the same size as Earth. Remember, these are artist impressions not real pictures. Kepler-20e and Kepler-20f were the first Earth-sized planets to be discovered. And then even more exciting came along Kepler-22b. Kepler-22 orbits in the Goldilocks zone, where liquid water may exist. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just the right distance from its star, just as the Earth is from the Sun. There may be liquid water there. And of course, if there is water, there's a chance of life. So we're discovering planets all the time now. So what comes next? Well, we must take images of them. And this is one of the very rare images of an extrasolar planet. In that tiny square there, in a disk of dust round a star called Formalhaut, the Hubble Space Telescope saw a very hazy image of a planet in orbit round that star. After this, we're looking for even bigger telescopes. The European Extremely Large Telescope will be big enough, I hope, to take images of those extrasolar planets. And once we can see them clearly, we may see features that suggest life is there. We can zero in on these planets and use spectroscopes to analyze the atmosphere. We're looking for an atmosphere which is similar to that of Earth, and eventually, we will find a planet that has got alien life on it. The spectroscope will show it. We may see the features on an actual image of the planet, and who knows? We may see the city lights of alien civilizations. And now it's time to meet our guest. In fact, our youngest guest. He's an astronomer. His name is David Tune. Hello, David. Hi. Thanks ever so much for coming along to Let's Talk Astronomy. Now, how long have you been? Observing the night sky? Uh, a bit over a year now. 
a little over a year. Yeah. And yet you've shown me images that, well, remarkable. And you do some massive photography too. Yeah. Super. Well, look, if you don't mind, we'll look, have a look at some of your pictures. And if you could talk us through how you look at the night sky. Okay. Fine. Now, I think this is your smaller telescope. Yeah. Is this the first one you got? Yeah. And would you say this is a telescope that people your age could use to look at the night sky? Easily. Easily use sort of thing, yeah. And what sort of kind of things did you first start observing through this? Mainly the moon and the planets, really. So you're a solar system person? Mostly. That's great. But I believe you've moved on. This yeah. is your own new telescope. Could you tell us a little bit about this one? Well, it's bigger. It's, hev <laughs> it's quite, after I made it's quite heavy. It's 20 kilograms, I think, this one, but... But it sees, it sees a lot bigger stuff. Yeah. Like it sees things bigger and brighter, high zoom, all that. Now, your first one was a refractor. This is obviously a reflector. What size mirror does it have? Six inch. So that's got good light gathering power, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Right, let's see some of the images you've taken through both these telescopes. Uh, here we see some craters on the crescent moon. Now, that, it says, is with your refractor. Yeah. How did you take that photograph? I just got, I just got the average camera... Point, point the eyepiece and just press the button. Good grief. Simple as that. So it was view it, focus it, click. Yeah. Is that your first ever picture? Mm, nearly, not N quite. So that's one of your early efforts. Let's have a look at some more. Oh, then again, this is through the 70 millimeter. Um, what camera is this then? It's, it's just ordinary compact camera, really. Yeah, and this is on fairly low power, I guess. Yeah, it's 36 times, I think, it's really low. And that means you can see the entire moon. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, now that's a good one, isn't it? You've got some lovely... Uh, that, that's really well defined there. Is that again with the same camera? Yeah, same yeah. camera, same scope, everything. Now we can see that you're getting more and more, and more uh, skilled at mm. taking these photographs. This is terrific. And this one, is that the refractor too? Yes. I took this one the day after I took the other one so I could see like the difference oh, the, yeah. the day makes. Yeah. And you've you got some lovely features up by the Terminator there. That's lovely to see. Ah, oh, now then, look. <laughs> Big improvement with the uh, bigger telescope. Yeah. So this is a day after first quarter. And again, you can see some lovely features along the Terminator there. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. But the same compact camera. Mm. Amazing. Tell us about this one. Well, it's, it's, so, it's the same day as the, as the other one, the day after last, the day after first quarter one, but... But it's 150 times zoom, and it's, and it's in the, this area where it's really cratered. Yeah. Superb, that, you know. Absolutely superb. Oh, and I love this one. The definition on that is terrific, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's in another... It's just the same sort of thing, another area of the moon. Yeah. I yeah. think that's a mountain range as well. It is, isn't it? You know, and then the, you've, you've got one of the lava plains there, and yeah. the craters are very well defined. That's super. Oh, now, <laughs> from the moon, you've obviously graduated to take pictures of planets. So tell us a little bit about this one. Well, I took it through the scope and then it kind of came as a blur, so I had, to, I had to use paint to make it a bit defined. Yeah. Well, you've certainly captured uh, the rings there, you know. You know, I, I, Galileo would have loved to have seen that, wouldn't he? Because his telescope wasn't quite good enough to see the rings of Saturn. He knew there was something odd yeah. about it, but you've got it defined there. You're not going to tell me that's with a compact camera too. It is. It out to out to enhance it a little. With out to enhance it to make the to make it more than just a blur on paint, but but it's showing what you'd see in real life. So what you're doing is not only taking the images, but you're also enhancing them. Yeah. In, yeah in, with software too. Ah, uh, now then, I'm glad you've put that message up. Look at that message, folks. <laughs> um, just a warning there from David about observing the sun. You've used a filter here? Yes, uh -huh. same filter. And we've pointed out a sunspot there. Yeah. When was that picture taken, David? Uh, it was taken sometime in May, I think. In May, yeah. Not <laughs> on a sunny day. Lovely. <laughs> and this is what I love, that you actually don't just take your photographs, you do drawings. This is how I started off observing. Yeah. Uh, I, a lot I, of them are just one day after another as well, so you can see how they change. So we've got a nice period of weather. You can see the moon to sunspots. You know, it's with this sort of thing, you can actually track the sunspots across and work yeah. out the rotation of the sun. That's terrific. Great to see. Oh, look. <laughs> We're now on planets and you do drawings. Yeah. I always draw Jupiter's moons. Yeah. And, and again, night after night, showing the changing positions. Yeah. And mentioning Galileo, this is terrific because those are evocative. 
these images are almost identical to the ones Galileo drew 400 years ago mm. when he first discovered those moons. That, to me, is the best picture you brought. That is terrific. That's wonderful. Oh, and another one of Jupiter. What have we got here? Well, I, I did this one paint because Jupiter just washes out straight away, but it's, yeah. it's what it would look like through my, through my big scope, but 150 times zoom. So you can see the belts and zones through your big scope, okay? Yeah. Super. Uh, what does 2012 hold for you? What do you well, hope to observe this year? First thing, main thing, transit of Venus. The only time it's the only time it'll in, in my lifetime. So I've got. Sure. <laughs> and I've got Mars. I've got. I've got. I'm going to look at Venus while it's not in transit, while it's in view. I've got Mercury, things like that. David, it's been a delight to talk to you. Thanks ever so much for coming along. You're welcome. Thank you. And finally, we'll take a quick look at the January night sky. Well, Jupiter is still beautiful and bright, but we're going to concentrate on the area to the east, to the left of Jupiter. Two wonderful constellations, Taurus the Bull with its red eye, Aldebaran, and Orion with those three stars that mark the belt. That's where we're going to look first. Above the eye of the bull, above Aldebaran, a beautiful star cluster the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. This is the best star cluster in the sky. You can see it with the naked eye, but how many sisters can you see? With binoculars or low power in a telescope, you see beautiful, hot blue stars. These stars, the Pleiades, are about 400 light years away. And now we go to Orion. Below those three stars in the line, the Orion Nebula. This is one of the showpiece objects of the sky. You do need a telescope to appreciate it best. Here in this picture taken by Steve Ibbotson, we see a cloud of gas and dust where new stars are being born. This is the best nebula for us to view in the sky. A beautiful, beautiful sight. And if you go on to high power, look right into that nebula and you may see four stars arranged in a trapezium. Those four stars light up that nebula. And if we look to the left of Orion, we see the Winter Triangle, made up of Betelgeuse in Orion, drop down to Sirius, the dog star, and up again to Procyon, the puppy star. The Winter Triangle, made of those three stars, and just above the triangle, the Christmas tree star cluster. You will need a telescope to see this. Its code name, NGC 264. When you get that in your telescope, can you see the shape of a tree? And finally, we go back to the start of our program and exoplanets. If you look to the right of Orion, winding around the sky are the dim stars of Eridanus the river. One of those stars, we've circled it here, has a planet in orbit round it. Epsilon Eridani, just 10 light years away, has a planet there. And as you look at the stars of the January sky, a lot of those stars you see will have planets going round them. On some of those planets, they might be life. On some, there could be intelligent aliens. And they'll be doing the same as we're doing now. Looking out at our sky and saying, is there anyone else out there? Thank you for watching Let's Talk Astronomy. The gallery is coming and so are our contact details. But for now, I'll say goodbye and wish you clear skies. <laughs>